I never dreamed of conducting a social or phys physically distanced funeral, unable to offer a handshake, much less a hug. One of you lost your mom a few months ago. You could not attend her funeral in Chicago, and you were left in a netherworld feeling sad, but still unable to fully process her death without seeing the grave forever denied that moment when the dirt hits the coffin, the painful sound that signals for us, this is real. But also tells us that we must move on and forward. Another one of you had a brother who died in New York you too could not be there for his funeral. We gathered for Shiva Minyan on Zoom, and when you spoke to us after the prayers, I never forgot how you said to us, I just want to be hugged. And you spoke a truth that we all felt, but we couldn't act upon. In these past few months, I've watched as Artie Axelbank performed a bris with new parents as they were alone in their home or accompanied by just a family member or two. I have recited a new baby's name through a screen over a cup of kosher wine from my living room, unable to join in the su'udat mitzvah, a meal which is a mitzvah, to celebrate that another child has come into the covenant. I have sat back there and waved through the window of our Beit Midrash at our B'nai Mitzvah, smiling as they were here, trying to help them to lead a congregation of friends and family, a few of whom were here, but most of whom were on screens far away. Some of you, for those celebrations, have brought cardboard cutouts of grandparents who could not attend, and I am moved to see these faces surrounding me. And a reminder, you can still order for Yom Kippur, and all of our proceeds go to help those who are hungry. But it's not the same. On walks around Trinity Park with our dog, Delilah, another person approaches me and I walk to the other side of the street. Or when running on East Campus, I make a wide circle around other runners to avoid coming too close. I take shallow breaths in the grocery store and stay focused on my shopping list trying to weave my way between fellow shoppers who now signal danger. I return home from those trips exhausted, from those trips exhausted from the stress. This year I yearned, I yearned to go to protests in our community to tell our black brothers and sisters, black lives matter to be there with them, to tell them unequivocally that racism is an unmitigated evil that plagues us, a sin with which our country has yet to fully reckon. Martin Luther King's dreams feel farther away than ever, but Friends in those moments said to me, our community needs for you to be healthy. You, you can't sick, get sick. And so I spoke. I spoke out. I reached out in other ways. But I kept my distance. I want to talk about distance, this Rosh Hashanah. It feels like that is all there is these days. It's in the air when what I want most is to feel close to you. And the distance hurts.
Someone once said, when they give you something for free, you're the product. Social media companies are now more valuable than oil companies. Our attention is a valuable commodity. And these companies use algorithms that are designed to keep our attention. And they work by filling our feeds with people who agree with us because that is what we are attracted to. We believe that Facebook or these other companies connect us to a wider world, that they somehow close the distance between us and the world, but what they really do is show us a slice of the world that mirrors our own opinions. Russian hackers pit us against each other and the upcoming election will only fan the flames and drive us further apart. In her book, Reclaiming Conversation, Sherry Turkle writes about how texting and device-mediated communication makes it easier for us to be cruel to one another because we can avoid the consequences of our language, of the, flame, of the pain that we inflict with unkind words. She writes about how face-to-face -face conversation is what teaches empathy and how it heals us. But now even a face-to-face -face conversation is masked. More conversation than ever, even, <laughs> even this sermon, is mediated through a screen. The distance is not good for us. And God, I imagine that for many of us, God feels very far away this year. Isaiah says, seek the Lord where God is to be found. Call upon him when he is close. Maimonides in the Laws of Repentance says that, law, says that repentance and prayer are always appropriate, but the verse from Isaiah teaches that between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, it's even more appropriate and it's immediately accepted. In other words, the high holiday period is when God can be found, according to Isaiah. Now, right now is when God is nearest, but I imagine for many of us, as 5781 begins, God feels far away. The Israeli poet Rivka Miriam wrote a poem about distance. It was gifted to me by my friend and teacher, our friend and teacher, Rabbi Sager. And I hope that this poem may speak to us, this Rosh Hashanah, and give us some tools to find a way forward. I'll read it in Hebrew and then in English. Hamerchak sheben nikuda le nikuda hu hisbir. Kamohu kamerchak shebeni leven ori. The sheben ha kochav le oro. Kamerchak sheben ha chole la bari. Sheben ha kmisha la tsmicha ve la pri. Sheben ha medaber leven mashin hie. Bidvaro. The distance between one point and another, he explained, is like the distance between me and my skin, or between a star and its light, like the distance between sickness and health, between withering and flowering and fruit, between the one who speaks and that which exists through his speaking. First, the poet says of all, of all of what we are being taught about distance is something that he explained. Who is this he? We get the sense that he is not there anymore. Has he died? Does he now exist only as a memory? Is he still alive but somehow inaccessible? Were these the words that he spoke before leaving on a trip during which he'd be unreachable? Or perhaps is the relationship over? 
and she is remembering these words fondly or maybe bitterly. We don't know, but even this teaching she is giving us about distance is distant. And yet, the poet begins by telling us that what we perceive as distance is like what's between me and my skin, which is to say no distance at all. Is there a me outside of my skin? I can look at my skin. Sometimes it peels off, so it's certainly not all of me, but it is part of me. Distance, she says, is like when we look up at the stars. Is there a difference between the object that we call a star and the light we see when it finally arrives to the earth? Up there, there is a star. There must be matter of some sort, fuel for the fire that burns, that creates light. But to us, there seems to be no difference at all. The star we know is just the light that we see. In reading the poem, I stumbled over this next phrase then, because the next phrase is, it's like the distance between sickness and health. And I, I know that there's a difference between that. I've been sick, I've had a fever. Maybe when I am sick, it's hard for me to walk, for me to eat. There's a great distance between those feelings and when I'm sick and when I'm healthy. When I'm healthy, I can swim, I can walk, I can move around, I have strength. So I called my friend, my teacher, Rabbi Sager, who's sitting opposite from me today. And we talked about this line in the poem because he's been doing a lot of thinking about sickness and health this year. What he told me about this line is that when you're sick, a lot of people relate to you as sick. He said, modern medicine has a lot of tests and monitors and scans to tell you all about your disease, but it's less good at quantifying health, at measuring all those things that we can still do, like write, like teach, like think, and speak, and pray, and be surprised by the world each and every day. I realize, he said to me, I'm not going to walk vigorously around the old city of Jerusalem like I used to. I look back on that me, he said, with some nostalgia, and perhaps sadness, but also with a sense of surprise and relief. Because doing that used to be a part of my sense of self, of who I understood myself to be, a vigorous person who could walk the streets of Jerusalem. And now, even though that part of me may be gone, I'm still here. There is an I who continues, even while part of me is gone. I think about our country and race and what we've been through this summer. And today, to me, our country feels sick, very sick. Over and over again, we witness black men and women killed too quickly and easily and cruelly by police officers in America. The dream of racial equality feels so far away. But I also have to ask, were we healthier before this summer? Or was acceptance of the status quo just a cancer growing inside us? Aren't the protests and the hard conversations of this past summer healthier than a smothering silence? Didn't these things move us closer to the dream of equality? The answer to those questions, of course, remains to be seen, but the distance between sickness and health might be closer than we thought. 
And our society literally is struggling with sickness. Coronavirus prevents us from gathering in stadiums and synagogues. We are not physically together this year, and there is much to mourn. But a theme that we as a synagogue have wanted to put forward to you is that we are not only alone. We are alone together. This year, so many of the things that we depend upon to tell us it is the high holidays, harmonizing in the sanctuary, seeing old friends in the lobby, sitting in the seat we know, looking at our loved one's plaque on the memorial board. So many of these things are far from us, but there's not only distance, not only because in a few minutes we'll listen on Zoom as Eric Myers chants Una Tanatokef, or because we heard Jeff Darby read the Torah as he has so many years before, and not only because tomorrow we can go and hear the shofar being blown in various places around Durham and Chapel Hill, but because though we are separated, we are still together, we're still going through this together. And because we know that people feel lonely, and we know that other people yearn for the things that we yearn for, we know that we are cared for, that we matter. In the past six months, our society has struggled with sickness. I have discovered anew what is so incredibly healthy about our congregation. I have witnessed you staying up through the night to watch somebody's body at a funeral home on your computer and meet in a Zoom room to say prayers for a tahara to continue our mourning traditions that honor loved ones who have died. You did this actually just two nights ago for a longtime congregant, Barry Bergman, who was laid to rest yesterday morning. I've seen you deliver challah and babka and these bags, 49 different people driving bags to each other's homes. I've seen you call and check up on each other and make a minion over Zoom each Wednesday morning or for Shiva Minyanim in the evening. Through the Rabbi's Discretionary Fund, I hope you know that you, we, our community has given thousands of dollars to Port Durham, to the Durham Public School Foundation to help feed Durham's children because children should never go hungry. I've seen you show up for church on Zoom and send letters of love and support to the River Church, telling them in a moment of pain that Black Lives Matter, telling like they told us after Pittsburgh, you matter. You're not alone. I've seen us partner with the Walltown Neighborhood Ministries and fill our Freedman Center across the parking lot with food that has been distributed just outside of our building every week this summer for the homeless and those most in need. There is health in this time of sickness. We have grown closer even as we are apart. The poem continues between withering and flowering and fruit, says the poet. And when I read that line, I asked myself, why not start with the flowering and end with the withering? Doesn't spring, right, and the flowering of spring come, bef be come before fall? Isn't fall at the end? But perhaps the poet is telling us that nothing can sprout or grow until something else dies. That every death actually is a beginning. And every beginning must include the end of something else. In the Torah reading that we read this morning, we read that Hagar went off and sat at a distance about a bow shot away for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. She walked away. There was distance between her and her baby. He was withering before her eyes, and she cried. And per then, and perhaps only then, the Torah tells us, God heard the boy crying. 
And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes. And she saw a well of water, so she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. The water, it turns out, was there before, but it was only with distance, with letting go, that she could see that the well had been there all along. How appropriate it is that Rosh Hashanah, our new year, comes in the fall as the leaves begin to dry up and wither. Because the distance between withering, between the withering of autumn and the blossoming of spring is also no distance at all. And finally, between the one who speaks and that which exists through his speaking, Ben Hamidaber, Uvein ma bidvaro, that last phrase, ma bidvaro, comes from a blessing. It's a blessing not all of us know. Shehakol niye bidvaro is the end of the blessing. And we say it when we're thanking God for even the tiniest morsel of nourishment, for a sip of tea or a sip of water. And she is telling us that the distance between God, who is so great and sometimes feels so far away, the one who speaks, and the most insubstantial part of God's world, that distance may seem so vast. But haven't we been reminded this year how small the world actually is? how connected we are not only to the people we see on the street, but as a society, as a country, even with others around the world, and of course, to the oneness of creation. Perhaps we can find God again, not by going on a journey, but through the gift of solitude and stillness, through listening, through the gift that we have been provided these days in isolation. The distance hurts. It is real. And as much as I wish I had an answer, I don't know when this all is going to end. But please know, pain is not all there is. In a searing letter written to his granddaughter after the death of his own daughter, her mother. Leonard Fine wrote to his granddaughter, I want for you my love, flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone, that you will be whole. The emptiness cannot be wished away, nor is there reason to try. All we need guard against is the swelling of the emptiness, its displacement of the other truths of our lives. You are the daughter of a mother who died just 500 days after you were born, but for sure her story did not end. Her death is a sorry fact of your life, but not, I pray, the defining fact. There is much, much more to her story than the tragedy of her death, and all that is yours too. There is light to be found in darkness, health in sickness, renewal in withering as we celebrate the creation of the world this year, may we never feel distant from the one who brought us into being. Let us now call upon God while she is close, and now and always, and let us say, Amen.